are live now. Welcome to Bible Quest. This is the Wednesday edition. And what am I doing, Jeff? Am I saying something wrong? <laughs> you, you you don't see Jeff yet, but he's he's laughing at me. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking for what we pay you, we should get a little bit more professionalism in the introduction. <laughs> Oh, yes. Anyway, today's the Wednesday program. We're glad everyone's joining us on this Wednesday afternoon. Interesting topic today, uh, from what I've been told. And I'm just going to turn right over to you, Jeff. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, or is it hey. Jeff? Who, who's coming in today, Jeff? Yeah, I, I guess I am. And, and you know what? That professionalism uptick right there, I think we're going to have to triple your pay this week. Thank uh, you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we're going to do something that we ought to do every now and then today. We're just going to talk about what the Bible is. If you're listening to this webcast and you're familiar with the Bible, um, you know what a lot of what we say is going to be reviewed to you, but it might be useful to you just to think about how to explain what the Bible is to somebody who's not familiar with it. And if you are not familiar with the Bible, maybe you've done a search online for introduction to the Bible, something like that. In fact, Drew, we ought to put introduction to the Bible. Um, in the notes there so that when people search, they might find this. That, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to talk about what the Bible is. And what prompted this is I heard somebody talking about uh, the Bible as a, just, well, it's Christianity's holy book. And, and the reporter who was using that kind of language said it in such a way that I got the impression the reporter probably knew nothing about the Bible and just, well, various religions have some kind of writings and whatever they are, who knows, but the Bible is Christianity's. So uh, there are a lot of people who don't know what's in the Bible. So let's, guys, let's just talk about what the Bible is. Um, let's spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Those are both parts of the Bible. So one time, years ago, I was having a Bible study with a couple sitting at the kitchen table, and I had been going on for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. And, and the fellow, he he stops me after a little bit, married couple. He stops me and he says, I, can I ask a question? I said, sure. He said, this Old Testament and New Testament you keep talking about, are they both in the Bible? And um, and I realized then that I, I you know, had made some assumptions. I had tried to, to not make any assumptions, back up and just start from square one. But I had not gotten all the way back to square one. So... Do you, each of you, do you have a way that you like to introduce the Bible to somebody when you have the sense they don't know anything about it? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I, um, maybe I'd, I'll allow Joe to go first. Sorry, I shouldn't have just jumped in. Joe, go ahead. You've been teaching for a lot longer than I have. Uh, well, uh, I think, I don't know that I have a better idea than, than you do. Um, but thanks for mentioning my name, Chase. It's nice to, to you know, have that acknowledgement that we didn't get at the beginning of the show. Uh, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so, uh, this a really rough start today. <laughs> so, so usually what I would do is just try to present the Bible and just say that it is a set of books that really begin with the creation of the world. And it, it's, it's a set of history books. And there are within those historical books, uh, God speaking to man in various ways, uh, maybe even mention something like Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, um, uh, but that all of the Old Testament is in effect pointing toward the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Christ. And so as we read from the creation of the world all the way through, and it's kind of uh, getting us closer and closer to the, the coming of Christ, uh, in fact, one of the things that I've done in some of the classes, I just did this a while back in a in a group of, of men. Uh, um, we have a, a Bible study that we have in a, in a local prison. And I talked about how when my wife teaches uh, children's classes, that she will present the Old Testament as uh, these books of the Bible that are saying Jesus is coming. And when we start at the beginning of the Bible, you know, it'll be sort of a whisper, just a little hint. Jesus is coming, like Genesis 3. Mm -hmm. and, and then it'll get a little bit louder in places like Genesis 12. Jesus is coming. Mm -hmm. And we just walk through the, the Bible story. And by the time we get to the end of the Old Testament, it's screaming, Jesus is coming. Uh, and then we turn to the New Testament, and there's John the Baptist, the one crying out in the wilderness. Uh, that, that's That's been kind of a helpful way 
I, I think at least to get the big picture. I like that. If I can just encapsulate what you said there, you've got a collection of books. There's 66 books in our Bibles, individual books. They're written by roughly 40 different writers over a time span of about 1,400 years, a uh, time span of about 1,500 years. And, and, and yet, as you go through these writings, they do, they do give a history of God's dealing with mankind and especially especially of God's dealing with the nation of Israel. But what that's all about is this idea of Jesus is coming. And it's quiet at first, and then it gets more and more pronounced and more and more clear, and you get to the latter books, and then there is Jesus. Chase, how do you introduce it? So often what I'll do is I'll, I'll have a stack of Bibles that I use for people I studied the Bible with for the first time. If they don't have one, I will just sit down with them and open up to the table of contents of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I will just say there's two Testaments, Old Testament, and New Testament, and those can be divided up in kind of the centuries that have gone by. Uh, the New Testament was written in the last 2000 years, but all in that first century. And then the Old Testament spans before that. But then what I'll have them do is I'll have them go through and I'll have them kind of bracket books and circle them and write out to the next uh, to the mm -hmm. side of them. So with the first five books of the Bible. I might have them bracket those and say, these are the books of history. This is all about the origins of the Jewish people and how God brought them out of Egypt and how God organized them as a people. And then I'll have them circle Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, and we'll call that the, the, um, you know, the history of God's people in the, in the land of Israel. And then just kind of go through the big sections of the Bible like that. And, Sometimes that'll be my whole first study with somebody if they're really just wanting to just to have an overview of what the what the whole Bible is about. That's yeah, I, I found that to be helpful. So if if we do this, if we say, okay, there was a man named Jesus who who was crucified two thousand years ago and raised from the dead, um, and he was the Son of God. Uh, now he he lived on Earth about two thousand years ago. Most of the Bible was written before he lived on the earth. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call the Old Testament. Um, and then, and that, that's, that's 39 of the 66 books of the Bible were written before he lived on the earth. And they were written over a time span of about 1400 years before he lived on the earth. Actually, not that much. Actually, we could say about a thousand years. But they, they describe events all the way back to the very beginning of time. And they describe how uh, God created everything and man sinned. And then starting right then, God starts hinting, well, I've got a plan to fix this. And as you go through all those, those 39 books that were written before Jesus, you see God's dealing with the nation of Israel uh, to bring Jesus into the world as a means of taking away man's sin. And then you get to the story of Jesus' life, and you have the beginning of the New Testament. There are 27 books that talk about his life, the work that his um, apostles, his disciples did as they went out preaching the gospel, and then letters that were written, directed by God, um, and uh, to, to various churches and individuals, and that would be the New Testament. So let's let's talk a little bit about the, the Old Testament scriptures, the 39 books that were written before Jesus came into the world, and we can divide those up into sections, and the first section would be what, and what would that section be about? Wow, I, I, I must not have asked the question very well. The Pentateuch is what I'm talking about. The, the people talk about the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So let's just quickly high level what are, what are found in those first five books. Start with Genesis. So the word Genesis means beginning, and that, that's kind of a helpful way of summarizing what's in that book. There's the beginning of the world, the beginning of marriage, the beginning of sin, um, the beginning of nations, um, uh, the beginning of uh, the promises that God gives to the patriarchs. Um, uh, you know, I, I understand. Well, I, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I, I think by, by just seeing the title of it, 
that at least helps you to capture yeah. some of the things that are listed there. Exodus would be the same way. So you have an exit. So the end of Genesis has, of course, um, the, oh, uh, someone wrote in and said also the beginning of languages. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's another good one in uh, Genesis 11 in the Tower of Babel. Um, but Exodus, they're literally exiting Egypt. It starts with the 10 plagues. And uh, we, we actually talked about that last week, didn't we, Jeff? When we were talking about Passover. Yeah. yeah. Um, Would have been great to have Joe here for that. But um, glad he's back now, I guess. But, and then, of course, Joe, what, do you, what would you say about Leviticus and uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy? Um, uh, well, the title Leviticus means pertaining to the priest. Um, but that's our title. Uh, not the title that was originally connected with the book, right? And so um, uh, as we think about the, the things that are in Leviticus, it's the establishing of worship, I think, would be a, one of the key thoughts uh, that is presented in Leviticus. Numbers, well, the, again, the title sort of reveals for us, you have a counting, a census, that is at the beginning of the book of Numbers and at the end of the book of Numbers. Um, uh, and so the, the title Numbers is, is pretty uh, uh, handy there. Uh, Deuteronomy, um, uh, the giving of the law to the second generation, um, uh, the telling of those, telling the law to those who are going to go into the promised land. And then after those five books, then we have Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, and those books kind of give a uh, a description of the history of the Israelite people, all from the time that they come into the land God gave them uh, until they get carried out of that land because of their unfaithfulness to God. And uh, they they are carried away to live in other nations, and until some of them are allowed, or they all are allowed to come back, and some of them do come back. So, yeah. so those books describe a history of God's dealings yeah. with this nation of Israel. And sometimes, what I'll have people do as as I have them go through the table of contents. Once you get to Esther, I'll have them put a little bit of a line underneath Esther, because from Genesis to Esther, it's pretty well chronological that as the books are arranged. And obviously there's some exceptions to that Kings and Chronicles are retelling some of the same stories just from different perspectives and for different historical reasons. But for the most part, that's your history of the Old Testament is Genesis to Esther. And mm -hmm. then maybe pack Malachi on um, mm -hmm. at the very end. But I think that's helpful for people to realize because they just naturally assume well, it's chronological. So Genesis is the first thing that happened. And then, uh, you know, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi is the last thing that happened. Well, if that's your understanding, you're going to get really confused when when you get into you go from Esther to Job. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. All right. So starting with Genesis and going all the way up through Esther, uh, you have this history, the beginning of time, the beginning of creation, the beginning of sin, the beginning of God's uh, revelation that he's going to solve the problem of sin. And then the the story of the God's dealing with the nation of Israel, and um, and we get all the way through all of that, and then we get into a section of the Old Testament where we have some books like Job, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and these actually all of these books are a different style of literature, aren't they? They are. Yeah, it's what we often call the wisdom literature. Sometimes people will call it poetry. Um, uh, but I think wisdom is probably more uh, uh, appropriate for the. the to Why do you think? I mean, obviously, it is poetry. It's they, all of those books, for the most part, are written in poetic form. Why would you emphasize calling it wisdom literature? Uh, well, I think mainly because it's not simply poetry. When we think about poetry, uh, that sort of brings up uh, an image in our minds of, of rhyme or whatever. whatever. Roses uh, are red, violets are blue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I can't say it, neither can you, something like that. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, anyway, um, you know, th this is revealing uh, so many practical lessons. Uh, the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, 
uh, so many practical lessons. Psalms teaches us how to how to pray and how to think. It it, it helps us to form emotions as we're speaking to and about God. Job reveals wisdom and how to deal with suffering yeah. and, and reliance upon the Lord. Uh, Song of Solomon, uh, a bit more challenging book, at least for, for me, um, uh, but one that describes love. Yeah, I just, Mar marital love. And I, I would just say those five books, they're all on this spectrum of wisdom. That, that's what I love. They're each uniquely, uh, they're each unique, and they address different aspects of wisdom on a spectrum. It's pretty cool. And, and I guess, strictly speaking, I said most of these are, are all in poetic form. Ecclesiastes has some poetic forms in it, but for the most part, Ecclesiastes is not in a, structurally, it's not poetic, right? Not all. No, yeah, not all the parts of it, certainly. Yeah. All right. So, so we got uh, a lot of the Old Testament. You have the beginning of time. You have God's dealing with the nation of Israel and all of that history. And then you get into these wisdom books. Mm -hmm. Then after that, we have a bunch of prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, and so on, all the way down to Malachi. And um, and what are these about? So typically what I'll do with people when we get to these in the table of contents, I'll, I explain it this way. Now, everything else you see, we can take and bam, we can sprinkle them all into First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, um, and parts of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And uh, because, again, they're not chronological, but these are prophets. And sometimes what I like to do, because we call them prophets, and if you're talking to someone that's new to the Bible, it's totally understandable. When they hear prophet, what do they normally assume? Predicting the future. Yeah. And there are certainly elements of that in these prophets. There, there's no getting around that. And a lot of the things that they say are going to happen as a result of visual sin do end up happening. But sometimes I'll help them by saying, don't think of these guys just as much as a prophet, as much as they really were preachers. They were trying to get God's people to do a certain thing or uh, a Gentile nation to do a certain thing in the case of Nahum and Obadiah and Jonah. Um, so anyways, that's how I've often described it. You sprinkle these in to first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. Now, Joe, going back to a comment that you made earlier, you talked about, I think you were talking about when Beth teaches children's classes, she's, you know, the Old Testament starts out, Jesus is coming, and then Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming as you go through the Bible. So let's just real quickly, and let's not take more than three or four minutes to do this, but let's just think through, starting with the first books of the Bible, uh, in a sentence, tell me something in Genesis that, that is hinting Jesus is coming. The uh, uh, the offering up of Isaac by Abraham, uh, great foretelling, a great picture of what's going to happen to to Jesus on the cross as he's taken up to the, the very same mountain, and uh, the the father is going to offer up the son. The so, curse to the serpent, he will strike your head, and then you will strike his heel. Sure. Yeah, those are two different things, and the one the one that Joe's talking about, of course, there's really a pre-enactment of God giving His Son as a sacrifice uh, and his son being raised from the dead, God has Abraham act that out. And of course, Abraham uh, is not aware, at least we would suppose he's not aware of the full meaning of what he's doing, but he, he does use the phrase, the Lord will provide. And that's what the story is about. God is going to provide a solution to the problem of sin. And, and so we come to the book of Exodus. Uh, this of course is uh, when Abraham's descendants have become a nation and yet they're slaves in Egypt. And so God's going to bring them out and give them this land, this promised land. Tell me something in the book of Exodus that that is looking forward to well, Jesus coming. Well, let's take it back to last week's episode on Passover. Kill an unblemished lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, and I will pass over you. Um, okay. So just the idea of, of sacrificing something innocent so that the death angel doesn't come yeah. to you. And then, of course, in the book of Exodus, you have the giving of the Ten Commandments and the law of Moses, all this uh, code by which the Israelites would live. Tell me something in the law that is about Jesus coming. Of course, all of it is, really, but give me an example. Uh, of something in the well, the, the tabernacle. The, um, uh, you know, the even the things, the, the book of Hebrews will really fill in a lot of those blanks for us about how, as we look back at things that are in the law, for example, uh, how they were pointing to uh, the greatness of Jesus coming. And the book of Leviticus is a, a lot of 
uh, legislation about worship. You talk about Joe and about sacrifice. Tell me something in the book of Leviticus that looks forward to Jesus coming. So there's a statement that's made in Leviticus 1 through 7. It's made several times, once about every sacrifice, that it is a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. And uh, then we turn to the New Testament and we see that the offering of Christ is a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord, Ephesians 5 and in verses 1 and 2. So, so we could look at those animal sacrifices, rightly look at those animal sacrifices of the Old Testament and see them as instructing man in the concept of a sacrifice, a life that is given to, to make atonement, to take away sin. All right, yeah. so so we don't have to go through each of those books to illustrate that point, but I just want to drive that home. Go ahead, Chase. I thought you were going to have us do it. That That is a very helpful exercise, though. That's a, that is a very good exercise to do. Just off the top of your head, go through every book of the Bible in the Old Testament and see how it points to Jesus. Yeah, good. All right. So we've got a handle on the Old Testament now. Um, just a brief introduction. You've got 39 books all written before Jesus comes into the world. The last of them probably written about 400 years before Jesus comes into the world. And and, and then we get to the the rest of the Bible, which is what we call the New Testament. And these 27 books are written over a time span of only 100 years, just within one century. So the Old Testament, the first 39 books of the Bible, they were written over a thousand year period. Uh, I said 1400 years a, a moment ago, but or 1400, but that really includes the, the time period between the end of the Old Testament writings and, and Jesus coming into the world. So really, the Old Testament scriptures were written over about a thousand year time period. And then the New Testament scriptures, once Jesus comes into the world, it's just, just a century, a hundred years. And the New Testament, I think we can divide up into three parts. You might want to divide it up into four. The th three parts I would have in mind would be four books that tell the life of Jesus. One that tells about the message of Jesus being spread throughout the world. And then a whole bunch of letters. Um, and so the first four books that tell the life of Jesus, what are they and why do we have four and what are the differences between them? We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all are telling the story, the life of Christ from different perspectives, different vantage point, nothing in contradiction, um, uh, but complementing one another, um, different purposes in their writing, uh, very likely even having in mind different audiences primarily. Um, John, I think, is maybe the easiest one to see that in. He tells us that he left a lot of things out, but that he included what he did to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, uh, and so they, they all have things in common. They're all telling about the life of Christ, but they have uh, different aspects or different parts of Jesus' life that they are emphasizing. So Matthew, what was his occupation? Tax collector. And what did he become for Jesus? An apostle. He became one of the 12 that Jesus specially trained, called apostles, to, and he, Jesus was going to send them out into the world. Uh, Mark, who was Mark? We, we presume, I mean, it's the same Mark that we read about in the book of Acts, uh, who is described as a young man in Acts chapter 12. He's also a preaching companion of Paul's at some times and in others he's not. Um, but he was prolific in the early church um, in the book of Acts. Luke and, and connected with Peter as well. Yeah. My son Mark. Yeah. And then a second Peter or first Good. Peter, second Peter. All right. So he had a close connection with one of the apostles. Who was Luke? A doctor. Physician yeah, and co, co traveler with, with Paul, co worker with Paul, the apostle. Uh, and so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all write accounts of Jesus' time on earth, very similar accounts, uh, cover a lot of the same events, um, but there's a, a little bit of a, a, a different slant to each one, especially maybe in terms of what is emphasized and um, maybe the audience they had in mind. Uh, John, who was John? John was an apostle of Jesus Christ as well. He was uh, John, the son of Zebedee. His brother James and him were mentioned together quite often, nicknamed the Sons of Thunder, the Sons of Bonerges by Jesus. Uh, they were fishermen that Jesus had called to follow him at the beginning of the Gospels. So so those are your four books that tell the, the life of Jesus, and, and they tell about 
uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and then named after the person who wrote. Them. Yeah, we, we call them by the name of the person who wrote them. That's right. So then Luke has a second volume. He writes what we call the Gospel of Luke, the life of Jesus. But then he has a second volume where he writes an account of the Gospel being spread after Jesus goes back up to heaven. And um, he focuses especially upon the work of two men. Who are those two men? Mainly Peter at the beginning, and then Paul, uh, the latter half, slightly more. And and one way to think of the book of Acts is also that the first part of the book of Acts is especially the gospel among the Jews in, in and around Jerusalem. And then the latter part of the book of Acts is the spreading of the gospel throughout the world to Gentiles. Um, and so you have a historical account of that. Chase, you said earlier that when we're in the Old Testament, you can think of the prophets as sprinkled in amongst the history. The New Testament is kind of like that also, because after we get past the book of Acts, you've got all these letters, and they're kind of sprinkled into the history that's described in the book of Acts. Yeah, and uh, one of those things you just sometimes don't notice until I heard another preacher going through the table of contents with a new person to the Bible. So right after the book of Acts, you have 14 letters that were all written by the Apostle Paul. The first seven are named after the recipients, so who, who he is sending them to, the cities in which those churches exist. And then the seven after that are named after the recipients, the individuals that Paul is writing to. So the first seven are cities, like churches that he's writing to, and the last seven are like actual individual people that he's writing to. Okay, let's test that. Romans, Galate, wait. <laughs> First, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Wouldn't, wouldn't first. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I guess I'm off. I apologize. Unless he's counting 1st and 2nd Corinthians as one. Yeah, no. I apologize. I think I did that. I did, uh, I did those off. Sorry. Yeah, yeah nine, so, nine and five. Nine. Yeah, nine and five. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, and so th then you so you have the letters to the churches and then letters to the individuals that Paul writes. Mm -hmm. okay. So you would have first and second Timothy, uh, Titus, and Philemon. So that would be four. Yeah. Four. Sorry. Yeah, I did my math way wrong on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we're preachers, not mathematicians. <laughs> All right. But when you think about Romans, you, we can locate within the book of Acts which tells about the spread of the gospel throughout the world and the work of Peter and Paul. And, and within the book of Acts, you can locate where Romans was written. You can locate where 1 Corinthians was written. You can locate where 2 Corinthians was written. Galatians, you can see, I believe you can see the beginnings of the churches of Galatia that Paul has in mind when he writes the letter of Galatians. You can see the beginnings of those churches when Paul first went and preached to them in Acts chapters 13, 14, for example. Um, and so you see this, this interplay, this interrelation between the letters that are written to these various churches and the history of many of those churches as described in, in the book of Acts. Okay. Uh, and then you've got some letters to some individuals. Um, talk about those just a little bit. First and second so, Timothy and Titus are, uh, younger evangelists. Uh, first, uh, first and second Timothy are not two different Timothys, uh, two letters to the same individual. Um, uh, but uh, Timothy and Titus are young evangelists that Paul is writing to encourage and admonish in the, what they ought to be teaching in the churches in which they are working in Ephesus and, and Crete. And unfortunately, some circles refer to these as the pastorals. And I, I I like to think it's because it mentions the qualifications for a pastor in that's First Timothy and Titus, <laughs> but unfortunately that's not why. Um, but Timothy is called an evangelist in First Timothy four, um, and Titus would be similar. So, and and then um, and then of course you have Philemon, which is Paul writing to a Christian named Philemon about. Uh, a young man named, I say young man, a man named Onesimus who was a slave, had run away and come to Paul and has become a Christian. And, and now he's going back to Philemon. And Hebrews, uh, won't take a lot of time to talk about Hebrews right now. James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, Jude. What do you want to say about those? Well, they're named after who's writing them. So 
Paul's letters are written or named after who he's writing to. These are named after who wrote them. Okay. And and then finally, you have the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is actually a letter or letters. The Lord tells John to write to seven churches. If you were going to, if you were going to just sum up what the book of Revelation is about, how would you do it, Joe? Jesus wins. Jesus wins. So it's written at a time when the Christians are suffering. There is conflict um, with the Roman Empire and culture. And uh, there's this encouraging message, Jesus wins. Good. All right. So so we kind of walked all the way through the whole Bible here. Oh, go ahead. I'll just make one more comment. If you said it, I'm sorry, Jeff. Uh, Jeff. First, second, third John and Revelation, you said are written by John. And this is the same John that wrote the Gospel, John. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Now, uh, so... So the Old Testament scriptures, there were there were some rules for Jews to live by. What book in the Bible lists? Where do you go in the in the New Testament to find just the list of rules? The the thou shalt's and thou shalt nots. The you know, uh, it, where where do you find that book in the New Testament? Where there's you got all these stories and stuff we've been talking about and letters. But where's the stuff like the list of rules that we have to follow in the New sure. Testament? It's, it's right at the very beginning of the New Testament in, in Matthew, um, uh, chapters 5 through 7. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I know that's not the answer you were looking for, but it, it was too easy. It was low-hanging fruit. Tell, um, us about, tell us about chapter 5 through 7 of the book of Matthew. Yeah, so that's uh, called the Sermon on the Mount, appropriately so. And uh, within uh, that sermon, uh, the longest sermon recorded by our Lord, um, uh, and uh, he does go through and he has lists, like at the beginning of Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12, the Beatitudes. And those are instructions on how to live. They are not so much a thou shalt and thou shalt not, like maybe the Ten Commandments, um, uh, but they are showing the character of the person who will be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Yeah, it's a picture of kingdom living. It's kind of a, a, a description of the code by which people in God's kingdom will live. Yeah. All right, so now give me the answer I was looking for. <laughs> Go ahead, Jace. There isn't one. Uh, so the New <laughs> Testament is, I mean, you have to read all of it. And and let me say, it's a very, uh, that's a very, that it's, man, let me get my sentence straight. That is a task that can be accomplished with ease. Take some discipline, but you can read through the New Testament. If you read, I think it's seven chapters a day, you'll read through the New Testament in less than two months. Um, So it it takes some discipline, but the New Testament can be read through, I think, at at a much quicker clip and pace than the Old Testament can. And so when you read through it in its entirety, yeah, you're going to run into different kinds of commandments depending on the kind of dialogue or narrative that's going on is that fair yeah so in other words what what i'm getting at here of course is that rather than just giving us a rule book god has given us a narrative he's given us instruction about how people became christians about how churches were organized he's given us examples of letters where paul or or john or peter had to write to Christians to correct misunderstandings, to give admonition, to give instruction, and all of those things then become uh, our guidebook, how how we are to live. I'd like to go back and I'd like to have you guys reconcile. So Joe said, well, there there is a, a section, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, and that's the code. And, and Chase, you said uh, there isn't one, and you're both right, but reconcile those two for me. Well, I think in some ways, the Old Testament even does a very similar thing. You have the law of Moses uh, that is described, and then you come along and have the prophets that are explaining to the people the things that they need, that they should have understood from those very things that are in uh, the law of Moses. And you have the books of history that show people either following or not following what God had told Moses. In the New Testament, you have the gospel accounts, the life of Christ that is painting this picture for us um, uh, of, uh, of the ideal servant, the ideal son, the ideal child of God. And then you have the history book of Acts that is 
uh, showing examples of people that obey and don't obey. And then the letters to the Christians written mainly by apostles, sort of like the prophets of old who were explaining uh, to churches how they ought to behave in accordance with the instructions that Jesus had given them. I, I will say the exception to that, I don't know if it's an exception because I don't disagree with Joe, is apostolic uh, authority. And so those writers are going to handle things that Jesus didn't necessarily handle, things that I don't think the church would have been able to work through if it wasn't for the apostles to come in. And I'll give you a great example of that. I think the teaching of circumcision in the book of Galatians. I mean, Paul has to kind of get in their face and say, if you're receiving circumcision and thinking that's what saves you, you're sinning. And he says, you cannot do that. And so there are tenets of the gospels in all of the epistles, but there are certainly places where the apostles will come in and hand out doctrine and say, here's the way it is in the, in the church. Sure. All right. Sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Joe. No, I'm, I'm just uh, in complete agreement. Um, they're, they're not exactly parallels, um, but they're also just not completely separate and apart in the, their uh, approaches, if you will. So now we, we, we think a little bit about, okay, what part of the Bible is relevant to us today? And, and one take that some would have is, well, we're Christians, we follow Jesus Christ, so it's the New Testament writing. It's the writings about Jesus' life, and it's the writings about um, how Christians, after he went up back up to heaven, functioned that are, that are important to us. And, and, of course, that's true. But let's take a moment. What is the value of the Old Testament scriptures to us today? What value is there for us to go back and read the writings that were written before Jesus ever came into the world uh, for us today? And there are a lot of answers to that, but I'd like to highlight some. Two, two that I try to emphasize when I'm, again, just sort of giving an overview. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 teaches us that when we study the Old Testament scriptures, um, that they were written for our benefit uh, to to learn to uh, to not rebel, to not be greedy, and and so forth, and and to recognize that God is going to deal with people who who disobey. Um, uh, you know, we need to be careful. Uh, take heed, uh, he who stands, lest he fall. Um, and then Romans fifteen, the other side of that, the beginnings of the beginning of Romans fifteen teaches us that by studying the Old Testament, we can understand the God of patience and uh, that, that it offers us hope um, as we study through those things. Yeah, good. I like the way you put those two together as two sides of a coin, the passage in 1 Corinthians 10 and the passage in Romans 15. And so summing that up, what you have in the Old Testament is we get a picture of God's dealing with man and how Man needs to take seriously God's word. Uh, sin gets him in trouble with God. But at the same time, to understand that God is a God of compassion and a God who wants to save us and who offers us hope. Uh, so, so you learn that as you, as you go through the Old Testament writings. What's something else that we get out of the Old Testament? One well, thing. Uh, go ahead, Jim. One thing that we've already hit on was the concept of sacrifice. There, there are some profound concepts that we need to understand. If we're going to understand Jesus' sacrifice, why it was necessary for him to die on the cross, and, and those concepts are established in the Old Testament ritual, liturgy, whatever you want to call it, <coughs> of the Israelites, which was defined in, for example, uh, Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And so you have these concepts of where there is sin, there has to be a sacrifice and, and, and there has to be bloodshed. We've destroyed a life by our sin, our own lives. And, and it's going to take a, a sacrifice of a life to fix that. And you also get the concept of intercession, there needs to be an intercessor, a mediator, somebody who can stand between man and God and advocate for man. And you see that idea developed in the Old Testament priesthood, the priests that were legislated under the law of Moses. Um, you see this concept of God's holiness and the, the idea of God 
saying, I'm going to take a people, a group of people on earth and define them as my people. But if they're going to be my people, because I am holy, they are going to have to be holy. And of course, in the Old Testament, that people was the nation of Israel. But that is kind of an object lesson to teach about God's New Testament people, those who are in Christ Jesus, and, uh, and they're going to have to be holy. They can't make themselves holy. God makes them holy through the sacrifice of Jesus. But then he calls upon them to live in sanctification. And so these kinds of concepts, they're really fairly profound concepts, and yet God hammers them home in both the law and his dealings with the, the Old Testament nation of Israel. So those are some kinds of things the Old Testament value for. There's a passage, just to go along with what you're saying, Jeff. It says in Galatians 3, 24, the law then was our guardian or tutor unto until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. Um, all those things point to, they help us learn things. And my answer was going to be the Old Testament. It shows us the character of God. And I, I think what you said about God's holiness, mm -hmm. um, God's desire for us to be holy, and how he reacts when we're not doing and being the people he said he asked or that he asked us to be, uh, that that is all stressed very very well in the Old Testament. So, uh, go ahead, Joe. Well, just one other point. So I mentioned the the negative and the positives that we can learn in First Corinthians ten and Romans fifteen. Another way of approaching that, that part would be uh, a passage like Hebrews eleven. If we want to understand what faith is the Hebrew writer is begging us, go back and study the heroes of the Old Testament. Sometimes Hebrews 11 is called the, the, the Hall of Fame of Faith. Uh, and then the other side of that one then would be uh, the book of Jude, um, uh, which has been termed the Hall of Shame. Um, uh, you know, you have uh, the uh, people out of the land of Egypt, you have Sodom and Gomorrah, you have Cain, you have Balaam, you have Korah. You have all these examples of people who did wickedly in the Old Testament. And Jude is saying, you need to learn from these people. Uh, don't imitate them. Um, so just so many values. The character of God, I think, is a great point to make. And, but connected to that, then, is what God demands of our character. There's another thing in the Old Testament that, that is valuable to us today. And, and that is that we see God is God of all the nations, and he holds nations accountable repeatedly in the Old Testament, you will see, uh, in the, whether it's in the prophets or elsewhere, but especially in the prophets, you'll see a, a description of God's saying, I'm going to bring judgment on this nation. I'm going to bring judgment on that nation. I'm going to bring judgment on the nation of Israel. And there'll be an itemization of the things they've done wrong. There'll be uh, things like violence. There'll be things like idolatry, where where man worships uh, an image that's not even anything real. And so it's really just a reflection of his own ideas, his own desires. And so it's really man making himself his own God. But when man does those things, when a culture, when a society becomes characterized by those kinds of things, God says, if they don't repent, I'm going to bring judgment upon them. And there's an expression in the Old Testament we see repeatedly, it's day of the Lord. And so there's, there's a day of the Lord that, that comes upon this nation or that nation. And all of that prefigures a final day of the Lord that's going to come at the end of time when all the nations are going to be judged by God and only those who are in Christ are going to be redeemed, are going to be spared, are going to be saved. And so one of the big ideas you get in the Old Testament is this, I, I use the word, accountability. God is going to hold man accountable. He held the nations accountable in the Old Testament, and he is going to hold the whole world accountable uh, at some point in the future. Excellent. All right. Uh, anything else you want to cap it off with before we wrap it up for today? We've covered the whole Bible in 45 minutes. <laughs> My, I mean, get the Bible, start reading it, and always, uh, this is called Bible Quest, so you can reach out to any one of us if you want to know more about the Bible. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, I don't expect to be with you next week, but Lord willing, uh, those of you who are listening uh, will get a chance to catch Joe and Chase next week. Thank you for being with us today on Bible Quest. Well, thanks a lot, Jeff. Now no one's going to want to come.